I'm Andy Olshan, Chair of the Department of Epidemiology, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and uh, especially uh, Dr. Wilson uh, for the special seminar. And I want to give a little background about the origin of today's seminar. This is an idea that's been um, uh, brewing for a little bit and uh, came from some conversations that I have with some faculty with Dr. Jim Merchant, who's here uh, visiting from the University of Iowa. And it's, it's really the realization now, maybe a bit late, but that you know, how important environmental justice research uh, and training is uh, uh, in the School of Public Health and certainly in our department, uh, and with a lot of local interest and support from NIHS and, and others, how important this area is. And so uh, in thinking this through, uh, we uh, decided to now start this as an annual uh, annual special seminar that we'll, we will hold in the School of Public Health and recognize, uh, invite and recognize a, a leader in the field to come and, and talk about environmental justice, their research, the uh, importance of the area, uh, of the, this uh, area. Um, also, in some ways, in many ways, this is to honor Steve Ling, who uh, unfortunately, as you know, is back in the hospital. Uh, is going to have an operation this week, and um, so unfortunately, uh, sadly, Steve you know, won't be here um, uh, today, uh, but this was really the development of this uh, seminar was with Steve, um, and to, again, honor the field and honor, obviously, Steve's major contributions in research and in training many students, not only just in epidemiology, but in the School of Public Health and at, at, at other uh, universities, even outside of uh, North Carolina. So. Uh, with that, I just want to give you some background. So we will be doing a special seminar every year and look forward to, to your attendance. And, and we will be bringing through illustrious environmental justice uh, researchers, such as Dr. Wilson. Um, and so with that, let me just briefly uh, introduce uh, Sakobi. For those of you who don't know him, uh, he's an assistant professor with the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. School of Public Health, University of Maryland at College Park. Um, he's an environmental health scientist with over 10 years of experience working in uh, community university partnerships on environmental health and justice issues. Um, he's worked on so many projects uh, in this realm, and you'll hear about some of them uh, that I'm not going to, to go through all of them, but just to give you a quick flavor for some of those. Uh, for example, the past two years, he's been building a program on community uh, engagement, environmental justice, and health to engage impacted communities, advocacy groups, and poly policymakers in uh, Maryland and the Washington, uh, D.C. area. He also still continues to do uh, research in, in the South. Uh, he has some projects now in environmental justice and advocacy in southeastern and southeastern U.S. He's PI, an NIHS-funded uh, research project uh, action grant uh, in Charleston uh, with the Charleston Community Research to Action Board and the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities. Uh, and so through these, and in that project, he seeks to examine uh, pollution and health issues in North Charleston and build community, uh, community capacity to address uh, these issues. So these are only uh, just a couple examples of the, the many um, uh, areas that he's been working in environmental justice. I said he'll be working through a number of them. He also has a number of rec awards and recognitions. I won't list all of them, but notably uh, among those, and uh, he received in 2008 the Steve Wing Environmental Justice Award from the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network. Um, he's been uh, he's on the board of scientific counselors for the CDC's NCE, uh, NCEH and ATSDR. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Exposure Science in the 21st Century. Um, furthermore. Uh, he's a past chair of the environmental section of the American Public Health Association. Um, also, he's known to many of you here because he received both his MS degree uh, and PhD in environmental health from UNC. We'd like to claim him, we claim him in epidemiology because he's a close collaborator with Steve and Steve's students, so we consider him in part of our group as well. He received his uh, BS degree from Alabama at, uh, Agriculture and Mechanical University. So please join me in uh, welcoming and thanking Dr. Wilson for this uh, important seminar. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Um, I was joking with his students before 
and that I'm, I'm really tired right now, but actually that's probably good because I talk really fast. <laughs> so uh, hopefully that means I'll be a little slower in my presentation, but I'm really excited to be here um, to honor Steve um, as a student in Denver. Steve was very much uh, a colleague, a mentor, and actually in many ways Steve, uh, when I was a student here, was, was a father figure, uncle for me. So the fact that he's going through what he's going through, um, it, it saddens me, but what hardens me is we have so many students who are here. His legacy is alive and well with the students in this room, with his colleagues in this room. His legacy is alive and well with me, you know, people like Chris Higgins at Hopkins, for all the community leaders and men, uh, mentors he's worked with, including Naima Muhammad, uh, Gary Grant, uh, Omega Wilson, um, Reverend Campbell, uh, and also the, the groups across the state. He's worked with Rick Dove, you know, he's worked with Water Keepers, Reach, um, um, Devon Hall. I mean, all the groups he's worked with in the state and the impact he's had. So I, I think, I mean, Steve's a fighter. And you know he's an advocate, he's an activist, and for me to be the first speaker um, in this in this seminar series to honor him uh, is very humbling. And um, and when I heard about it, I mean he said he wanted to do it. I was very moved by it because when we do EJ work, you know you have to be passionate about it, you have to be committed to it. And so it's not about you, it's about the community, it's about collective action. So I just want to share with you some of my experiences. I was actually trying to rearrange the slides a little bit because I, I wanted to talk about my experience as a student first, but those slides are later. Uh, but first thing I want to do is a mention, today the Goldman Awardee for North America was announced. And the Goldman Award is the basically the Nobel Peace Prize for environmental activism. So Destiny Wofford with the Free Your Voice campaign in Baltimore, uh, she won this award, it's officially announced today. And the reason I'm showing this is, it shows you the power of students. She started working with Free Your Voice as a high school student at Ben Franklin High School in Baltimore. And I'm, uh, I'm really excited uh, for Destiny and Free Your Voice because you, can sh you see the impacts that students can have on addressing environmental justice issues. Uh, as I joke with the students, I had a small contribution to the effort uh, I provided technical assistance to Free Your Voice, and I've been working with them to provide, you know, environmental health information for the last four years. And I actually had a student team in one of my classes that I teach, graduate students, they did a health impact assessment of the proposed incinerator. So we shared that information with Free Your Voice in their Human Rights Fair Development campaign. And so you can see what the power of science, the power of data can have in this type of work. So when you're doing environmental justice work, regardless of the discipline, for me it's important to make sure that science that goes with civic organizing, community organizing and civic engagement, and make sure that science is used to translate research to action and positive social change. So that's just the, something I wanted to highlight today uh, to show that Destiny and her group, they were able to stop the largest trash incinerator in the country from being placed in their neighborhood. But unfortunately, this same community hosts the largest medical waste incinerator in the country right now. Okay? They also host a large coal fire plant. In 2007 and 2008, out of 4,000 zip codes in the U.S., based on toxin release inventory, air pollution releases, this was the most polluted zip code in the whole country. 2007-2008. Luckily, in 2011, they're only number 75, 75 out of 4,000. Okay? So, the, the thing about environmental justice is not just, you know, the social movements about understanding the science, right? So th these communities in Curtis Bay, where Destiny lives in, they're exposed, they're impacted by multiple hazards. The coal fire plant, multiple TR uh, inventory facilities, so you have multiple chemicals being emitted to the air, they've been exposed to chemical mixtures through multiple pathways, multiple routes, and also you have psychosocial stress. So it's exposure to both non-chemical and chemical stressors that impacts this community. So this is a typical thing about community impact environmental justice. What's the profile? What's the profile? You have a certain social demographic profile. It may be cases of being both poor and people of color. It may be being rural uh, and people of color when it comes to Warren County. It could be poor white rural. When you think about fracking in West Virginia, you think about fracking in Pennsylvania. It could be indigenous poor 
room, you think about folks impacted by energy extraction on reservations, uranium mining, or folks who may be impacted by uh, contaminated fish and their cultural fishing practices, they cannot continue to do those things. It could be folks in indigenous, rural, poor, isolated. Think about Alaskan, Inuits, and the impacts of POPs, persistent uh, pollutants, on their health and their communities. It could be urban communities who have been gentrified, like Baltimore, uh, Washington, D.C. It could be urban communities whose, whose infrastructure has fallen apart, like Detroit, or disinvestment, divestment over multiple decades, like Detroit. It could be rural communities, like in Mississippi, who also don't have access to good infrastructure, or MEBIT, the Western Revitalization Association. So these communities have similar social demographic profiles, they have similar bur burden profiles, they have similar hazard profiles. So one thing to note when you think about environmental injustice, you have the intersection of race, class, place, hazards, vulnerability, and invisibility. Thinking about beyond Flint, Flint was a man-made disaster, but there are multiple Flints across the country. Hurricane Katrina and Rita, what happened in New Orleans? That's a type of Flint, right? An intersection of a man-made disaster and a natural disaster. Think about how people with Hurricane Sandy. Who was impacted by Sandy? And the waterfront uh, impacts pollution and flooding. And the recent Snowzilla. Those same communities were impacted by Sandy were just flooded out again uh, by the recent Snowzilla in the, in the, in the Northeast. So I'll now get to my first slide. <laughs> I told Andy, uh, 45 minutes, I'm going to do my best. So when you think about, you know, a lot of my work is trying to connect environmental injustice to, you know, health disparities. And so, I mean, one of the things that I learned is when you think about health disparities, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the slides, it's, it's not just about, you know, the disease outcomes themselves. So when I think about environmental injustice, I'm talking about how, you know, traditional framing, how some communities are differentially burdened by hazards, as I just talked about in the going across the country, right? These different geographies, these different racialized spaces, gender spaces, and how people could be uh, impacted by pollution. It's also, if you think about Flint, um, like the political process, and how some communities may not be, how the, they may be disenfranchised. So with the reason Flint is very, uh, much of a great example of disenfranchisement, the fact that the emergency measure law was applied in a way which took, stripped the power from the citizen, they voted in the mayor, they voted in the town council, they stripped that power from them. To me, that's a violation of civil rights. That's a violation of their ability to be, to, to actually have representative government when you use the emergency measure law. In many cases, when environmental justice communities, communities that are impacted by environmental justice or environmental hazards, they also don't have, do not have a voice in the process. Their voice is not heard. That's why I said invisible. They may be invisible populations. They may be quite vulnerable populations whose governments may not represent them. Or they could be like Mebane, when you think about Wera, or think about Rena, where they're unincorporated. So when you're unincorporated, that means you don't have a town council, you have representative government. It's contamination without representation. Okay? I'm going to say it again. It's contamination without representation. So usually what you see in unincorporated communities, uh, when you have a t nearby town, that's where you'll see the super treatment plant. That's where you see the industrial corridor. That's where you see new industrial developments. And at the same time, in the south, what you see the profile is those communities also don't have access to sewer and water infrastructure. They may not have paved roads. They even may have gutters. For those of you who are in planning, they may not have proper ingress and egress accessibility. So these are what we call pre-New Deal communities. These are the things that the New Deal was supposed to fix. So many communities across the south you see that pattern of development or underdevelopment. And so the leg two of this of my EJ stool, you see these communities that have a high concentration of psychosocial stressors. Let's, take, let's go to Freddie Gray's example. You know, you had this whole Baltimore uprising, right, around Freddie Gray, uh, the events of, of black men in America who've been murdered or dealing with police brutality. Freddie Gray, he died on the way to uh, police uh, police headquarters. And the thing about Freddie Gray that's, that's interesting is the environmental justice issue, he was exposed to lead early in his childhood, right? So we know that lead can lead to adverse health effects, neurological, behavioral, neurological effects. We see the lead issue in Flint. 
with the children and adults who were supposed to live, and think about the impacts of their life course, think about the wisdom susceptibility for children. And so land is an issue that we thought we addressed in public health. Land is still an environmental justice issue. Just because we got lead out of gasoline, where did all that lead go? We still have lead in our souls. We still have homes that are built before 1950 that still have lead paint. We have a high concentration of older homes in Baltimore. So there's still people today, right now today, who have been exposed to lead paint. Children right now have been exposed to lead paint. Um, we still have lead in places where people may be urban gardening, too. So urban agriculture. So you think about the psychosocial stressors, we have to think about that from a social terms of health model and really understand the intersection of being exposed to hazards and also being exposed to these stressors. And then in many of these environmental communities, they may not also have access to infrastructure. So again, think about the issues in Flint. They had, you know, some potable water issues, the issues in Memphis Arena, people may not have access to emergency services, they may not have access to public regulated sewer and water infrastructure. So Omega Wilson is one of my community mentors, he, he calls it the lack of basic amenities. Those of you who know Omega, raise your hand if you know Omega Wilson. Those of you who know Omega, he calls it the lack of basic amenities. So we have communities in this country, uh, residents of this country, who do not have access to publicly regulated sewer and water infrastructure. Uh, they may not have access to, access to clean air. They don't have access to safe, uh, clean water. They don't have access to healthy foods. They do not have <coughs> access to safe housing. Millions of Americans in this country. And then we go to the rural communities. Most people who are living in rural communities may still be on well water. So in places like North Carolina with CAFOs, they could have contaminants, pesticides uh, from agricultural uh, operations, but when we think about the CAFOs, they could have uh, nutrients, nitrogen, they could have microbes, E. coli, they could be exposed to emissions from the um, confinement houses, from the lagoons, volatilization of ammonia, hydrogen sulfide, and also from the spray fields. Similarly, in, in eastern shore of Maryland, there's a huge concentration of chicken farms. So we also have similar issues with exposure to chemical contaminants and also microbial contaminants. But when you look at the health infrastructure, many of the communities are overburdened by environmental hazards, may not have access to green space, may not have access to parks. There's a huge uh, body of literature, growing literature, on the fact that many communities, underserved communities, don't uh, live in food deserts or maybe in food swamps. And so how do we address these problems? So again, environmental justice is not just the hazards it's exposed to these stressors and lack of access to infrastructure. How can we build resilient communities who do not have good infrastructure? So when you think about the science of environmental justice, it's a new science, it's a new field, so it's an emerging field. Uh, let's think about the issues of cumulative risk, risk assessment, cumulative risk assessment. We have to look at the various chemical exposures, the various exposures of physical agents, the various exposed to biological agents. We have to understand the fact that many communities have been exposed to chemical mixtures. Our science is not advanced enough to understand the impacts of exposure to chemical mixtures. But then when you add in a psychosocial exposure, what does that mean? Is it an effect modifier? Does it, does it lead to direct impacts? What about the synergism, multiple effects, added effects? Our science needs to grow. We need to have new methodologies. And that's why it's important for environmental health scientists and epidemiologists to contribute to understanding cumulative impacts and cumulative risk. So when you think about environmental injustice, we focus a lot on burden disparities, but these burden disparities can lead to uh, exposure disparities, whether it be exposure to particular matter, if you live near a heavily trucked roadway, there's been a large body of work looking at uh, schools near heavily trucked roadways, uh, been exposed to what we call traffic-related air pollution trap, and uh, birth outcomes, whether it be low birth weight, uh, babies for mothers who live near these highways, uh, whether it be uh, low, uh, high infant mortality or birth defects. And then when it comes to the schools, we see high rates of asthma in children, uh, hospitalization rates, emergency department rates as well. Um, thinking about exposure to metals, such as mercury, we have a large population of people, because they don't have access to food, uh, because they don't have access uh, to healthy infrastructure, they may be fishing from contaminated rivers. Okay. So we think about subsistence fisher folk in the U.S., that's an environmental justice issue too. So they could be exposed to the accumulation of, uh, accumulation of contaminants in fatty tissue to mercury, to lead, to arsenic. And so that's an important issue as well. And then we have risk disparities and then we have health disparities. So will it be disparities in asthma morbidity, asthma related mortality, will it be disparities in cancer morbidity, cancer mortality. So 
the field of environmental justice as a science is growing and emerging because we need it to grow and emerge to really understand what are the exposure issues for the most vulnerable populations. I mentioned to some folks today that I teach environmental law and policy. And I think it's a, you know, I enjoy teaching that class at University of Maryland. But I think the problem with our current regulatory schema, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Safety Water Act, and, and additional uh, laws and regulations, they were meant to um, protect the most vulnerable group. But to me, they're not protective enough. Think about the profiles of these communities that just outlined. You have multiple hazards, right? You have multiple facilities. They're releasing multiple chemicals. They're physically being exposed to biological agents and also physical agents. They're also being exposed to psychosocial stressors. I don't think the Clean Air Act was really meant to protect those populations. I don't think it's protective enough. And so I think we need to have an overhaul in that regulatory schema to actually protect the most maximized, maximum exposed populations and also these differentially exposed populations. So I will not go into this too long because as Andy said, I only have 45 minutes. But uh, a lot of my work looks at sort of micro social factors and how they operate through segregation. So I do a lot of work on residential segregation and relationships between segregation and environmental justice and how they contribute to health disparities. And also for me, a lot of environmental injustice is caused by planning zone development. There's power, privilege, and isms in how we zone, plan, and develop. Segregation is what? Exclusionary zoning, planning, and development. Gentrification is expulsive zoning, planning, and development. The same populations that are differentially impacted by segregation are the same populations that are differentially impacted by gentrification. Think about that. Why are more people valued than other people? Why is more land valued than other land? Why do we put certain facilities in one location and not put in another location? It's connected to power. It's connected to privilege. Your economic power equals your political power. If you are low income and politically disenfranchised, you're going to have limited economic power. You're going to have limited political power. And so for me to address environmental justice, we have to have a systems approach. We have to create healthy community ecosystems. And so I think all communities are undergoing dynamic process of salutogenesis, uh, which is a, co a term coined by Antonovsky about how do you promote wellness and well-being across all of this environment, the physical environment, the built environment, uh, natural environment, social environment, economic environment, local environment, social environments. And so for me, we have to modify context, right, place matters, to make sure people have access to uh, grocery stores, green space, so like their you know, food solutions, banks, good schools, good opportunity structures, and less uh, Im impacts or less burden of pathogenic infrastructure. Food packages would be fast food restaurants. Um, and other packages would be check cashing facilities, payday loans. You've seen the, the, the neighborhoods that have a higher abundance of these health restrictive facilities and ones that have a, a, a better access to salutogenic infrastructure. Those are things that we need to make communities resilient. And based on that, I think we would have better population health, we reduce health disparities, it can lead to uh, more well-being and more sustainability. So, uh, one of the approaches that I use in my work, um, you know, I do a lot of community-engaged research, and I wouldn't be here today speaking to you if it wasn't the opportunities that were provided to me by Steve Wing. Uh, I, I intimated a story to Andy and some of the students about how, I think in 1999, um, Chris Haney and I, uh, Kim Moreland and maybe two other students, we attended the second annual Environmental Justice Summit, Community-Based Environmental Justice Summit at the Franklinton Center in, in Bricks, North Carolina. So we attended the summit. I was a master's student in Ember, and I came back excited, passionate, and I said, Dr. Wayne, why don't we have classes like this in the School of Public Health? Why aren't we doing this kind of work with communities? How can we do this work? This is environmental injustice. I don't want to be a part of this. I think I can help. I'm still a student, but I can talk a lot. I think I can help. I have a lot of energy. And so, and Chris was really excited, Kim was really excited, and so we challenged Steve to create a class. We worked with Steve to develop the syllabus and the curriculum for that course. And that's, uh, I, don't know, what's the, I don't know the number for the course today, but it's this community-based environmental justice EPI course. And that's a course that I was the first cohort who took that class back in, I think, 2000. And he's been teaching it 
ever since. And so for me, you know, community-engaged research is really important um, as a way to get involvement, uh, to have community input, and to, you know, build trust and communication. So some of my work that I'm doing right now in Maryland, and I, I don't have slides on this, I just want to kind of use this diagram to, to explain it. I teach a, a couple courses where I have students doing environmental health practice projects. So last semester in one of my graduate courses, I had students do health impact assessments. Uh, those of you who know what HIAs are, can you raise your hands? Okay. So I think HIAs are great, right? It's a really good way, for those of you who are in DB, I'm going to still call it DB and not health behavior stuff that y'all don't know what's going on there. Y'all are Hebe to me. Uh, so for those of you who are in Hebe, right, it's like a needs assessment, right? It's probably a needs assessment. For those of you who are in Inver, um, you know that the National Environmental Policy Act requires an environmental impact statement. You're going to get any kind of federal funding to do a big project. And you know that the only time that the NEPA uses the word health when it says healthful environments. NEPA does not focus on human health. NEPA focuses on uh, really the health of the environment, okay? And so when you do an environmental impact statement, there's no requirements to look at the impacts of that project on human health within NEPA. So you have this huge HIA movement, which is basically filling the gap uh, created by that um, lack of requirement. So I had students do, as part of their, their practice projects uh, practice, uh, in the class, one student group did a health impact assessment of a, of a proposed uh, soccer stadium and electricity generation plant in Washington, D.C. Uh, D.C. United is building a new soccer stadium on top of an old landfill. So there's potentially landfill-related waste that people can be exposed to. There's also a lot of truck traffic for construction. So a lot of the dust, so people can provide PM10. And then there's some other brownfields and other concrete plants in that community. So that's a, that HIA was a product provided to uh, that community partner at the end of the semester. We also had a student group that did a virtual health impact assessment with my community partner in Charles, which I'll talk about, uh, look at the potential impacts of an intermodal facility. Uh, so think about good, you know about goods movement. So you have a lot of ports, you have the goods moved from the ships, you have goods moved on rail, you have goods moved on truck, diesel trucks across the country, across our you know, the state highway systems, uh, internet, uh, interstate highways. And so they did HIA on that. I also had another team do an HIA on uh, concrete plants and uh, industrial development in Sheriff Road area, Prince George County, uh, looking at diesel exhaust, black carbon, PM for Bob, and another HIA in Brandywine, Maryland, which is uh, southern Prince George County, where they have 10 surface mining operations. Uh, they have a coal fire plant, two proposed coal fire plants. Uh, there's a landfill, a sludge lagoon, a coal ash landfill. Nearby community has a coal fire plant, one proposed power plant. Another nearby community has a coal fire plant. In that same community, they have an incinerator, a landfill, and a proposed incinerator. This is all in the same general area. So this is basically the dumping ground for Prince George County. And a thing that is similar to what's going on in, in Medan with Guerra, and also what's going on in um, Reno, it's unincorporated. So another example of contamination without representation. And so we've been doing a lot of outreach uh, and consultation with those groups. And my undergraduate class this semester, uh, um, my undergraduate EJ class has actually deconstructed the graduate students' projects. It's kind of real reversal. And what they're basically doing is, is taking pieces of them and really expanding those projects. So now I have undergrad students working in three of those communities uh, doing student projects in Brandywine, in Sheriff Road, and also in Buzzard Point. And they're doing photo voice, they're doing community mapping, they're doing zoning analysis, they're doing a dissemination campaign, and they're also doing um, one student team is using low cost sensors to measure. Uh, PM 2.5, and these are undergrad students. So in this process, they're doing outreach, they're doing consultation, they're doing involvement. And again, a lot of the, this work that I do in these communities is modeled after the work that I did you know, with Steve and the work that I've done, uh, that I did as a graduate student here at UNC uh, with the West Center Violation Association. But for me, you know, to do this work well, I think it's very important to make sure the work is community driven that the work is community-based participatory research. And as you know in this room, Steve, that's what Steve does. Steve is the people's professor. You know, Steve allows community members to speak for themselves. Steve allows community members to, to you know, give, use their research to give voice to community concerns. 
And one of the things that I think is powerful about the work that Steve has done uh, is it's about empowerment. I've, I was schooled on talking about, you know, one of my community mentors said, Jacoby, you can't give us power. Like the empowerment, don't use empowerment. We already have power. So the thing about empowerment is helping community members connect to the power they already have, providing space and opportunities for communities to actualize that power, to be at the table, to be a part of decision making. So how can we use science for empowerment? The most important thing that I do as a scientist is not actually looking at biomarks of exposure and looking at mechanisms of effects and doing the monitoring. It's educating residents about the issues, building their consciousness through an environmental health literacy framework to empower them to be more engaged and, and go through their own process of self-determination. That's why I think it's powerful about public science, democratization of science, about CDPR, about participatory action research is providing people with resources and data and science for self-determination, for actualization of the visions for that community of what they want to have. Not just about stopping things, which you hear about in EJ. It's about what should my community look like? What's the vision that I have for my community? What do I want to lead to my kids? How do I make my community sustainable and healthier and more equitable? So y'all know the definition of CPPR, uh, you know, collaborative community-based approach, you know, and that means of engaging all stages of the research process. You know what the core values are. Uh, one thing I want to note on this slide is, a lot of times in, our, in the research that we do, you know, we talk about community members as uh, subjects. The only time I use the term subjects or objects is when I do a presentation on it. I try to, in the work that I do, and Steve taught me this, People are the experts. They are the contextual experts. A community member living there, Hall Kafo, is the expert on that experience. I do not live there, Hall Kafo. A community member living there, incinerator, is the expert on experience. I do not live in their incinerator. A community a member living there, heavily trafficked roadway, is the expert on the experience. I do not live by heavily trafficked roadway. The individuals who live Rena in the Roger Road neighborhood, they live in the landfill. They are experts on that. Live without sewer and water infrastructure. Connected with water in Flint or connected with water in Mevin. They are the experts on those experiences. And so for me, I want to make sure the science that I do values community knowledge. Values contextual expertise. You know, we work to make sure that communities have their power and can again use their power. And so as, as someone who does this kind of work, I try to be a facilitator. I try to be a director. I try to be a catalyst for change. I'm not the expert on every community issue, but I have technical knowledge in this, in, in, that can be leveraged by the community to help solve those problems. And uh, I mentioned this to the students in our, in our discussion. And, uh, and some of you may know Boyer. I was going to get Boyer's first name. Uh, but Boyer's five minutes is a science I think is important to note. When we do research, and I think there's a tension when we do research in what knowledge do we value? How, what science do we do? And whose science, you know, is a science that we, what we deem as credible? Whose science do we deem as having an impact? impact and whose science do we deem as science that is worthy of being published, uh, science that is worthy of being funded. And so for me, I talk to my students about doing all five dimensions of science. They're like, Dr. Wilson, uh, I've been told that we have to publish to be successful in academia. I say, you know, that may be true, but there's a difference between publishing a high impact factor journal and having an impact. And I think, for me, when you think about the scholarship of inquiry, we really emphasize knowledge production and knowledge commodification in academia. Uh, and then for many of us, our science stops there. We don't take it to the next steps. But it's important to do science of teaching. As I said before, community members are the contextual experts on their experiences. We need to learn from them, and they can learn from us. You have to have the science of integration. Integration is really about interdisciplinary science. When you think about uh, these problems, particularly environmental justice problems, you can't look at them just from one angle. You can't look at them just from one facet. If the problem is a mountain, I have my pickaxe as a environmental scientist. I'm pick I have my, that's not good enough. 
We need geographers, right? We need planners. We need lawyers. Uh, we need sociologists. We need epidemiologists. We need to have a multifaceted, prismatic approach to attack and address environmental injustice. Okay? And this is a scholarship engagement. I don't think we value this enough, but in my course, I make sure that we, we engage the communities in the work. And that's, again, what I learned from Steve, learned from working with Naima, learned from the mentor of uh, Gary, and learned from working with Omega Wilson here. And also what I currently do with my, with my partnerships now. You have to engage the communities of concern in the work. And then the last scholarship is the scholarship of application. Applying the data to solve problems. And my kind of critique of the science that we do, and think about Mark Edwards' work in Flint, I mean, he said that we need to do more public science. That we may, a lot of science that we do may not be valued in the tenure promotion process. Doesn't mean it's not valued by those communities of concern, right? It may not be valued in, in, in our ability to get funding for it. But when you do get some funding, we don't have funding. If you're working community and you have an impact, that work is valued. In, the, in my short career, in the work that I've done with communities, working with Mevin, as a student, we helped to get uh, community members first time installation of sewer and water infrastructure. We helped to get community members roads paved for the first time. Okay, Working uh, with Destiny, we contributed to them stopping the incinerator. Working with a community in Delaware, I had a student do a health impact assessment of a proposed chicken processing plant. That HIA, which is her capstone project, helped that community group the Indian River Community Association stopped the chicken process plant from being built. Now, we did get some pushback, and that's the problem with it doing environmental work that's a political. We received a letter from, I think, the Chicken Board of Council for Delaware, and they asked, they sent the letter to my president and also the, the dean of School of Health, and they asked, why is the School of Health in Maryland doing work in Delaware? And I was told in a nice way, do you plan to publish this work? I said, no, I don't know. I wanted to, but we don't want you to publish it. 